Good morning, everyone. Uh, what an exciting time. Um, so uh, I'm hoping you're all receiving this uh, loud and clear and can see the various people that you would normally be looking at face to face for the National PPA Support Group meeting. Um, this is historic for us, uh, of course. Um, but mainly what I wanted to say before getting too uh, caught up in the technology and what a great thing it is that we can all see one another and talk to one another uh, while being sort of many, many miles apart, is just to, to say right from the get-go um, that we do understand and feel for you for what's been happening over these past few months um, and what a difference it's been since the to the world since we had our last PPA support group meeting. I was looking back over it um, just the other day and it just it seems like an entirely different world um, and I think we're all managing things but in particular we're very very aware of what you're all managing um, and at what we we've been taught about and really now are trying to come to terms with is the particular challenges of COVID for people with PPA uh, you know at every level really um, from vulnerability to the to the th to the illness but right through to the particular challenges of things like managing face-to-face um, -face communication when people are having to wear masks and you're not getting the sort of cues that we all rely on. So, you know, this has been a, a, a massive transition for everyone and we are very aware of your your the challenges that you're facing. Um, we, we're hoping, and, and we'll probably talk about some of it today, that we will um, be able to offer you some practical help, support, advice. Um, but obviously one of the most important things that we've all learned is how important it is to have, oddly enough, given that we're all now remote, the support of other people for all this. And just to say that the team here, <coughs> one of whom you can see hopefully, um, are, are here for you. And uh, you know we, we're trying our, our best to try to do what we can to help through this. And I hope that that is the message that comes across loud and clear. Um, as, as sort of times go by and hopefully we begin to return to normal, but we, of course, none of us can say when that will be. Um, so we've got, um, I hopefully a, a fairly full but, but useful agenda um, today. Um, and what I will try and do is just sort of, as we would if we were face to face, just transition between people and sort of give them a, a little brief queuing in and out, but just to give you an overall form of the day, um, I will stop talking imminently. Um, I don't have to tell you about um, fire and safety precautions. Well, if I do, then we're in trouble because we're living in the same house. Um, but I, I, so we can dispense with all of that. But I will tell you about the people that we've got lined up. So um, Seb, I, I'm sure I don't need any introduction. Seb Crutch um, will kick off shortly talking about um, RDS and some very exciting developments with rare dementia um, support. Um, and then Claire Waddington talking much more about direct um, support on the ground after that. Chris Hardy will give you a research update, um, some really interesting and exciting things going on in the world of PPA, despite everything that's going on with COVID. Um, and then Anna Falkmer, who's our expert speech and language therapist, will talk particularly, I think, today about virtual communication. And what we'll do, hopefully, at about around about quarter to 11, if things are going to time, uh, is a Q&A. Uh, and many of you have, have, well, have sent through questions, very, very helpful. You, you can send through real-time questions, I'm told. Um, it, we, we, we're trying to use chat to do this, um, and, and uh, Nikki behind the scenes is, is managing um, that. Um, but we'll, we'll have a moderated session and hopefully be able to address some of the concerns and questions that you've had. And then we should hopefully wind up, uh, if the technology is with us, uh, at about 11.30. Um, I wanted to say, because it's easy in all the excitement also to forget the, the local people that are involved, a, a, an extremely big thank you um, to the team that have made this possible um, and basically have allowed me to come and plonk my face on your screen. Um, and they're really tireless and have been working um, so hard to do this. So, so Emily, who I think at the moment is behind the, the scenes, sort of getting everything going at a technical level, and Claire, with the sort of basic bringing together of the meeting. Um, and Chris Hardy, who is um, instrumental to making these meetings the success that they've they've been, who has been working very hard to make the transition into this odd remote COVID compatible world that we now live in. So what I'll, I'll try and do now without further 
ado, I think, is hand over to Seb Crutch um, to update us about uh, rare dementia support. Uh, so if we can manage this transition, Seb, I'll try and hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. And just to extend my warm welcome to all of you. Uh, some, many of you I will have had the pleasure of meeting before, others not. If this is your first meeting, then a very warm welcome. So as Jason said, my name is Seb Crutch. I'm a psychologist and I'm involved in helping to co-lead rare dementia support, which means our groups, not just for people living uh, with uh, one of the language forms of dementia, but also visual, behavioural and inherited forms of dementia as well. Um, and it's been really a really exciting time for rare dementia support. The rare dementia support is the umbrella term um, which st we started using four or five years ago to bring together these different support groups. Um, and it's been a real pleasure and excitement to see how those groups have evolved. They of course started historically as handfuls of you living with one of these rare conditions meeting together for a cup of tea in an informal chat with the kind of folk in the team uh, today um, initially just for people who were um, had received their diagnosis or attending one of the clinics in queen square but very rapidly opening um, to people from living with these conditions across the uk and also internationally um, and we now know that, for example, through our website, that about 70% of the um, people visiting the site come from outside the UK, because there are just very, very few other opportunities um, to do what RDS hopes to do at its core, which is to give those of you living with one of these rare conditions or caring for or about someone who is the opportunity to meet each other, the opportunity to um, get acquainted with someone else who knows something of the situations and the challenges that you're facing and from whom you can share your experience to help them and they hopefully can share experiences or ideas, strategies, tips um, uh, that can help you to live as well, as well as possible with these conditions, which we know is really tough. Um, I suppose one of the main developments in the past couple of years has been the move from it being not just support groups, um, but to being um, direct support one-to-one -one in between meetings as well. Work obviously started fantastically by people like Jill Walton and Susie Henley, and now carried on, as you'll hear in a minute from Claire, uh, by the, the RDS direct support team led by Nikki Zimmerman um, with Claire, Libby and, and others, and Emma Harding and others involved. Um, I think a real excitement for us has been how we uh, with this ambition to try and reach and support people right across the UK, everyone living with one of these conditions, is of course us wanting to recognise our own um, areas of expertise, but also where we need to strengthen. And so we're really excited that just last week, uh, Nikki and I and others um, appointed our first Admiral Nurse, a new partnership with the charity Dementia UK, um, which will bring a new Admiral Nurse um, dedicated to uh, family nursing care, particularly for people living with the later um, stages of one of these rarer forms of dementia. And so that for us strengthens our team, which was initially focused because of our clinic around diagnosis and management of early symptoms of these conditions, through to our ambition to really support people right through um, their, their journey with this condition. Um, I saw I hesitate using the word journey because some people absolutely loathe that term. Um, but that sense that we want to be a place where one of the con few, I suspect, I fear, uh, places where, from which you are never discharged, where we can be a constant, hope to try to be a constant um, source of support. We might not be able to help with everything, we, uh, but we hope we can direct you or signpost you to people who can help if we can't. And that we will always be here, always be someone you can come back to, particularly living with these uh, progressive conditions as new challenges or new symptoms or new situations emerge, uh, which are different from what went before, and where you may need a different type of support or understanding or help. Um, in order to cope as, as well as you can with that, whether it's personal and social, whether that's financial in terms of benefits um, or other forms of care support. Uh, another excitement for me um, in the past year or two um, has been really seeing how we've managed to strengthen the base, the foundations of rare dementia support, um, which includes fantastic partnerships with UCL, our host organisation, um, who are providing legal and insurance support. So things that sound um, perhaps not so exciting, but are really important to us, like um, the across the 
currently 26 regional support groups um, that uh, Roberta McKee-Jackson helps to co-lead and coordinate, where many of you are running small groups, groups in your area, either dedicated to one particular rare form of dementia or covering a range of different issues for people with different rare forms of dementia. It's great that UCL have said, yeah, absolutely, people who are volunteering, who are giving their time generously, be it business volunteers or professionals, wherever they are, they're doing it as UCL volunteers. So of course we, we are responsible for them. They're covered by our insurance policy. So that sense of ownership, that this is a UCL led collaborative service is really important to us and helps us to describe who we are and to develop new partnerships with other organizations like the Admiral Nurse the Charity Dementia UK tie up that I mentioned. We're also really excited to see new developments over the past year, including things like the, uh, the um, free legal advice service uh, created in conjunction with the UCL Centre for Access to Justice laid, led by Professor Dame Hazel Gen. And that's a really valuable support because we know we can't be the absolute experts or arbiters in all the different areas um, which your condition will touch or influence. So we want to be able to point, point you towards or partner with people who can provide that specific expertise. And of course, as always, there will be areas of support which we are unaware of that you need um, or you will have ideas about how our service could be improved and we are always welcome and very glad to receive those ideas during meetings in between meetings whenever um, uh, uh, so that we can try to make sure that the service is as much um, an equal service with where your support and your experience as the real experts in living with these conditions is shared and spread with as many people as possible who need to know that, that those truths. We're also deeply grateful for our partnership with the National Brain Appeal. And they are, as many of you will know, um, they lead on fundraising for rare dementia support and have supported many of our members uh, who've kindly decided to bake things, knit things, climb things, all sorts of different activities, uh, creative and crazy. Um, for raising some money and support, but also the National Brain Appeal are uh, leading on a number of funding applications to organisations and trusts and charities um, that can support aspects of our work. So, for example, we're very, very pleased to have um, a donation from the Mercer's company um, who are supporting a new educational role, which Chris Hardy is leading on and funding the new Admiral Nurse Post. That's really valuable to us. Um, and we're also very grateful to the Maclay Foundation, who uh, the National Brain Appeal have worked with to create funding for the new grief and loss programme that Jill Walton is leading. Uh, many of you in the past year have helped hugely with the new website. Um, which we hope is a more friendly and open uh, platform for share, you to share your experiences. And that, of course, is an ongoing thing, but we don't want to stop there just with a, a website and good information and engaging videos, but we want to eventually create a forum where you guys can interact um, and share your experiences, your ideas in an appropriate um, manner for you. And of course, we're very pleased to have our first ever um, research project attached to Red Dementia Support, the RDS Impact Study, which a number of you already kindly contributed to, um, which I hope will really enable us to communicate the value, the impact that these support groups have, that this bringing together of your experience as peers, as people who know what it's like to live with these conditions, and our efforts as professionals working in particular specialist areas of knowledge like neurology and neuropsychology and what that partnership together can bring to try and um, increase people's um, ability to live with these conditions if they receive a diagnosis and as they progress. So uh, I think that's about it for me for now. Um, we have also flagged up in, the, in previous meetings that are very exciting plans to uh, create a new rare dementia support centre which would hopefully be a home, something a little like a Maggie Centre um, to host these meetings. But obviously for now, uh, we're meeting virtually. Um, and I've been really stunned by how willing people have been throughout this lockdown and uh, COVID-19 crisis to meet and engage and share openly. I hope that will be um, something which you are able to benefit from today and would just um, encourage you to take part in opportunities, big support group meetings like this, but also the smaller forum and um, online conversations that we've started to host um, and which Claire will probably mention more of in a minute. So I'm very happy at any point to take further questions about rare dementia support, where it's been, where it is and where it's going. Um, but for now, I'll hand you back to Jason and hope you enjoy the rest of the PPA meeting. Bye for now. Thank you very much, Sarah. That, that's terrific. It's very, very exciting. We are very, very excited here, truly, about the um, whole sort of developments with RDS. It's transformed um, 
Seb's uh, energy and vision being very, very important with that. But there's so many people that have been very hard working. And, you know, I think it's a sense that we're on the cusp of a major transformation. Um, so so that's it's incredibly exciting. Um, just before I hand on to our next speaker, who will be there, um, I just wanted to say a special welcome. I'm told I'm, I'm sort of um, trying to manage technology here, and I'm told that there are about 55 people now with us and actually growing. Um, and that will include new people. So I wanted to say a particular welcome to people who are brand new um, in this slightly unusual way of running the PPA support group. You may be coming to their first meeting. Um, and because I don't want to remain a mysterious figure, just to say I'm, I'm Jason Warren and I'm one of the neurologists that works at the um, Specialist Cognitive Clinic and in particular running the PPA research um, program that we have. And uh, I help uh, Chris Harvey, um, who's the main PPA support group uh, so the scientific lead, um, if you like, uh, run the run the show. So we'll hand over now to our next uh, scheduled speaker for today. It's Claire Waddington, who will talk to us more about um, direct support. Um, so Claire, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jason. So it's really, really lovely being here today. Although, of course, I would much prefer to be able to see all of you in person. So for those of you that I haven't met before. I'm a member of the Rare Dementia Support Direct Support Team, alongside my lovely colleagues Nikki Zimmerman and Libby Wood. So the Direct Support Team provides information and guidance over the phone and online to Rare Dementia Support members from all over the world. So these members include health professionals, people living with PPA, as well as those supporting someone living with PPA, which might include friends and family members. So this support can include helping people to navigate how to get a formal diagnosis of PPA as we know that many people struggle with navigating the healthcare system and that it's not uncommon for people to go through a really long process of diagnosis or to initially be misdiagnosed. The direct support team also provides post-diagnostic support to help people living with PPA and those supporting them to better understand the diagnosis and to put in place some practical strategies to support their well-being as someone living with PPA or supporting someone with PPA. We provide guidance on empowering the person with PPA to maintain their independence where possible, to continue to engage in meaningful activities, and if more support is needed for that person, to direct people to the appropriate local health and social care support to help meet those additional needs. So the direct support team also provides guidance and information on advanced care planning, including introducing additional care into the home and having the support in place earlier rather than later. Also providing information to assist care homes to better understand and support people living with PPA with their particular needs. Additionally, Supporting people to think about planning for emergencies and having a care plan in place so that if you are living with PPA and if the person who usually provides you with support isn't able to do so for some reason, that there is a plan in place to ensure that you're able to access the help that you may need. We've also put together some resources to support people if they are caring for someone with PPA that is going into hospital and may not be able to effectively communicate their own needs to the staff, as we do know that this is a particular concern for people affected by PPA, especially at this time. So we know that the current situation has been incredibly difficult for many people affected by PPA because of significant changes to routines, not being able to access usual forms of support in the same way, and because of the challenges with communicating and understanding the restrictions that are in place. We have had an increase in the number of people contacting the direct support team as a result of these changes, and we've been supporting people to put in place routines and different ways of coping whilst these restrictions are in place. We also know that it has been really difficult for people supporting someone with PPA who they don't live with, so who maybe lives on their own or who lives in a care home, with concerns around how to communicate effectively and stay connected with the person with PPA in these circumstances. So Anna will be talking a little bit more about strategies to support virtual communication, which I know a number of you will find really helpful. 
So the Rare Dementia Support Team are also trying new ways to connect people with PPA and people supporting someone with PPA. We've set up a buddying scheme where we are linking people together who may be at similar stages of caring or of living with PPA so that they can share experiences, tips and coping strategies. We've had really fantastic feedback from those who we have already connected, particularly about the benefit of being able to speak to someone else who has shared experiences and understanding. So please do let us know if you would find it helpful to be buddied with another member and we'd be really happy to facilitate this where possible. So as Seb mentioned, we've also been facilitating some small online groups to enable up to 12 people to meet virtually and discuss topics such as what support health professionals can provide, independence and identity, care planning, grief and loss, and we've also had a group specifically for people with a diagnosis of a rare dementia. So these groups so far have been fantastic with members creating a really engaging and supportive environment for each other. And it's also been a really helpful learning experience on our end to be able to be involved in these discussions. So I particularly wanted to highlight how amazing it has been as a team to be involved in the group for people living with a range of rare dementias, including PPA. So those taking part in this group have been incredibly compassionate and open about how their diagnosis is impacted on their own identity, how they respond to misconceptions about dementia, how they're educating professionals as well as friends and family about their diagnosis, and strategies that they've been using to increase their independence so as not to be defined by their dementia. They've also provided such amazing kindness, humour and empowerment for each other and we're really looking forward to running another group for people living with dementia in the upcoming sessions alongside the other groups that we'll be running. So thank you also to everyone who has registered for our next round of groups. We've had a huge number of people respond so we've had to close the registrations. It's really fantastic to see so many people finding it helpful to be able to access these groups. So we know that restrictions are starting to lift in some places, but that many people will continue to spend more time in the home. Rare Dementia Support has put together several COVID related resources that are available on the website, including an emergency kit with suggestions of at home activities to keep people engaged and help build those routines. Strategies to support people with communication and behavioral symptoms and tips on how to look after your well-being if you are looking after someone else. There are also some short videos with tips and strategies on managing during the lockdown, including the importance of spending time outdoors. So taking time for walks, spending time in gardens and on balconies, and how beneficial this is for general well-being. There are also arts and cultural resources to help keep people engaged in those meaningful activities, including things like virtual dance classes, museum tours, arts and creative activities, and music sessions. Many of these activities may not rely so heavily on speech and communication, so may also be more accessible to people living with PPA. We've also had many conversations with friends and family members and people living with PPA on creative ways that they've been keeping active and engaged during the lockdown, including arts, puzzles, baking, virtual concerts, at home exercises, gardening, the list goes on. So please do keep letting us know the strategies that you are using because it's really positive for us to hear and also because it may be helpful for us to be able to share these with other people who may also find them beneficial. So as well as providing one-on-one -on -one support, the direct support team also helps to link people into the Rare Dementia Support Impact Project, which is a worldwide study looking at the impact of support groups on people affected by rare dementias. So this includes current and former carers, as well as people with a diagnosis of PPA. People participating in the project can be involved in a number of ways, depending on what their preferences are. But this can include taking part in interviews, being involved in online aspects, and engaging in creative activities. So we have already had interviews with a number of carers, as well as people living with a rare dementia. 
and those that we have interviewed have provided incredibly valuable insight into their experiences and we're hugely grateful for this. So just before I finish, I just want to make it clear that if you are finding things difficult and are in need of additional support, that it's important to make contact with support locally. So this includes social services for needs and carers assessments, the GP for healthcare concerns, and care agencies if you need additional support in the home. While many services have changed the way that they're working as a result of the restrictions, these services are still being provided, with many appointments taking place over the phone or over video conference. Care agencies are also still providing services, as well as putting in place new packages of care, and a number of local authorities have received additional funding to support their caseloads during this time. Your needs are hugely important, and these services have a duty of care to make sure that you, as a carer or a person living with PPA, are safe and supported. And I also just wanted to highlight that if you do need additional support, please do get in touch with myself and my lovely colleagues in the direct support team, and we'd be really happy to arrange a time to discuss support with you further. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire, and they are, they are really nice people, I promise. Um, and I just wanted to say how important, once again, you can't stress it too much, teamwork is. And teams, are, even before it became a buzzword for a particular platform that we're using in COVID, teams have, has always been a, a very, very critical part of what we do, but it's absolutely instrumental. Um, it's great to think of a worldwide team of, you know, a, a sort of a, a massive initiative like that, but actually the, the teams that I think we value the most. Well, first of all, is you are all members of the team because you're telling us what we need to do and how we need to shape the service. And as Claire mentioned, that's absolutely vital. Without that, we 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 we, we can't be useful. We can't know what's going on. So you are essential. But I also wanted to really plug the team here who've been such a support to to me and to my colleagues in the clinical service and do so much behind the scenes, sort of ongoing. And the, even the people who's Faces you won't see. So, um, so Nikki Zimmerman, who uh, who is often, I know many of you will have spoken to, um, sort of relay some of your questions and concerns to me, and, and hopefully allows us to try and respond to them. Um, is sort of you know as as people's clinical uh, issues arise uh, on their journey, um, and uh, sort of Roberta McKee Jackson, of course, who you've heard about the local groups is is instrumental in being the sort of outreach person who runs a lot of what's going on more in your local areas um so there are people you know behind the scenes through the really unsung um nikki's actually handling the chat i think at the moment and all the sort of the background activity that's going on so keeping things humming along which would be an example of that um but i need to hand over to uh chris hardy um, who will be giving you a research update. Now, I like to take every opportunity to embarrass Chris um, and you know, we'll do whenever given the opportunity and I have a platform here, so, so I'm sort of going to try and do that now. Um, Chris is um, extremely self-effacing, but actually um, has been absolutely instrumental in the success of the PPA support group, um, including the meeting today. Um, he's multi-talented. Um, to, to use a clumsy metaphor, which I'm going to, we often think of PPA as a bit of a marathon. Um, and Chris is an athlete, a marathon runner and triathlete. Um, and I know some of you are curious about the fate of the London Marathon. We have a team fielding London Marathon, and Chris is one of the members, Anna and um, Nikki and Seb. Um, I can't even imagine how intrepid you'd have to be to actually run somewhere, let alone run 26 miles, isn't it, Chris? Um, so we're all hoping that that still goes ahead. I think 4th of October is the latest word on the street, but hey, we'll have to probably wait a PM's announcement or something on it to, to know when that's going to happen. So we're, we're still hopeful we will fill the team in the London Marathon, um, but research in PPA is of course a marathon of its own. So I'll hand over to Chris, who will give us an update now from a more scientific perspective about some of the recent exciting progress on the scientific front in um, PPA. So Chris, hand over to you. Great, thank you, Jason. Thanks for that very, very kind introduction. Um, I've actually recorded my um, my uh, update in advance because I don't trust my internet connection. Um, so I'm in a strange position of introducing myself. So I'm going to hand over to a, a recording I did a couple of days ago in a different room of my flat. So hopefully this will work, and hopefully we'll see you 
on the other side. Thanks, Chris. Um, so yes, I'll take you through some of the research uh, that we've been doing and, and I'm just talk a little bit about how our research has been affected uh, by COVID-19. Uh, and I'll, I'll focus on sort of three main strands. So strand one is that many of you would have taken part in research studies with us in person at the Dementia Research Centre at UCL. And those of you who have done so, we know that we like to see you once a year and that we do lots and lots of different assessments with you, including things like having a brain scan, lots of psychology testing, questions about your medical history, hearing tests, blood, urine samples, sometimes a, a spinal tap as well. And so over the course of that two or three day visit, we collect as much data as we can so that we can try to understand more about what causes PPA, how we can detect it as, as early as possible and things that we can do to help people uh, living with different forms of PPA. Now, of course, these visits have had to be cancelled since March, but that has given us sort of an opportunity to work on analysing some of the data that we had already collected. Um, and thankfully, our department had quite considerable foresight and set us all up for remote access to our data early on. And there are normally very strict rules about this. Um, we need to access highly sensitive data, highly personal data. So we're normally only allowed to access that from hospital computers. But actually, we've all been set up with access, uh, with remote access, so we can see those data whilst we're working from home uh, in a secure and, and a safe way. And so across the research groups run by Professor Warren, Professor Crutch and Dr John Laura, there are probably around 20 different researchers working with PPA research studies, with, with PPA data at the moment. And I can't give an overview of all of them right now. But just to give you an example of one important study that's actually just been published uh, in the last couple of days, uh, this is led by Jeremy Johnson, who's a clinical research fellow who many of you will know from his presentations at previous support group meetings. And he's published some work, uh, some important work in logopenic progressive aphasia. So we know that people with LPA can sometimes make mistakes when they say words or when they write words, getting parts of words mixed up, for instance, saying aminal instead of animal. And there are lots of different ideas as to why this might be the case. And Jeremy looked at some data uh, in a way that nobody had ever done before, looking to see if people with LPA had problems with the input side as well as the output side. So he gave people a written list of pairs of words that differed very, very subtly. Uh, for instance, life versus live, and then said one of these words out loud, for instance, live, and asked each person to circle the word that he had said. What he found was that people with, or some people with logopenic aphasia had more difficulties with this task than people with other forms of PPA, and that these difficulties weren't explained by any sort of problems with hearing or, or anything else. And it's potentially quite important because it suggests that potentially these problems with the, the output, with getting these parts of words mixed up when speaking and writing, might be linked to, to problems uh, with, with input and, and with how these very small parts of speech are represented in the brain. And so that opens up a, a really exciting possibility that actually if we could train people on the input side, so if we can if we can help people to understand those differences between those very small, uh, those very subtly different words, it might make a difference in, in terms of speech and, and writing output. That's not the only uh, research project that's sort of nearing completion or, or that's just been finished. So in, in Professor Warren, uh, Jason's research group alone, just to give you an idea of the range of research questions, uh, Elia Benamu has been looking at how people with PPA react to music. Uh, to give us a window on how PPA affects the brain's ability to make predictions and to manage surprise. Jess Jang is a new PhD student and she's looking at how people with PPA learn to understand noisy speech uh, to give us an insight into the difficulties posed by the often challenging listening conditions with lots of background noise in our daily lives. May Carmen Rakina Kamuro has been looking at how people with PPA perceive time and Harry Sivasathia Seelan has been looking at how people with PPA understand social and emotional messages in different kinds of laughter and other vocal sounds. And all of these projects are, are sort of ongoing and all of the data analysis is ongoing, uh, despite the fact that we're going through this crisis. So strand two is that we obviously don't know what the future will hold in terms of our face-to-face -face research with people coming into our centre. And whilst we'd like to get back up and running as soon as possible, it obviously has to be safe 
for people to do so. And we won't ask people to come back until we can be absolutely sure that it is safe. So we're conscious that it might take a little while. And in the meantime, we're thinking about whether it might be possible for us to carry out some research over the internet using something like uh, a webinar or you know something like Zoom, uh, some form of, uh, of video conferencing software that would mean we could see, see into a person's home without physically being there. And we're particularly keen to see if that might work for some of our psychology tasks. Now, this would be a big change in the way that we do research. Um, so we've asked our, our research ethics committee, who are the people who oversee all of our research, uh, all of the NHS research, research studies, just to make sure that what we're doing is safe and, and that we wouldn't cause any harm to everyone. anyone. Um, and so we're, we're waiting to hear back from them uh, to see if, we, if we'd be allowed to start doing some research in this way. We're very conscious that this type of thing might not be for everybody and I know from personal experience I find it I actually find it really difficult uh, to be in, in this sort of format where you're talking to a screen rather than talking to a, a person sitting in front of you I find it much more cognitively demanding and I, I think that's going to be a, a really challenge a real challenge for some of the work that we'd like to do but on the other hand it might mean that our research becomes a little bit more accessible for, for some people so for those of you who are joining today who can't make it to London or who live too far away um, or who, who can't come to, to do the face-to-face -face research it might mean that that we're able to that, that you're able to take part in, in research it might mean that ultimately we're able to see more people so the silver lining from this crisis might mean that we that we do change the way the way in which we conduct research and, and it might mean some very exciting things for us in, in the future so if you'd like if you're interested in hearing more about this and would like to be contacted once we've got the go-ahead from the ethics committee then please do let me know um, and of course, I should mention, uh, I'm sure that Seb and uh, or, or Jason will mention this uh, or Claire in, in their updates. I just mentioned that the RDS impact study is something that is still ongoing and that, that's a study of, uh, of support group members. Uh, it, it was always planned to be a series of telephone interviews. So those are, are going ahead and uh, the data from that will be really exciting uh, when it's collected. So finally, strand three, I wanted to talk to you about some of the work that actually all of you or many of you have been helping with over the last few years. So we sent out um, some surveys to members of the PPA support group earlier in the year in which we had put together some, some stages for each form of PPA and we asked for your feedback and these stages ranged through from very mild to, to very profound and under each stage we had listed different symptoms that we thought uh, might happen uh, at each stage. We asked people to tell us whether the symptom had been put in the right place or if it had been put in the wrong place or if it was absent entirely. And to cut a long story short, and it's a really long story because we have something like 30,000 words of, of, of comments uh, and uh, as I said, uh, about 100 different individual responses. But to cut a long story short, it looks like we've done a pretty good job with the sages, although we might have to change the order of a couple of symptoms. Um, it's, it's looking, I think, really promising. So the basic structure of the sages is there. There are some other really important findings as well that, that were sort of tangential to, to what we're really looking for. But we asked some people some background, we asked people some background questions uh, about the age the person with PPA first experienced symptoms and the age they first went to the GP. Just to give one example, what was really striking was that for people with semantic variant PPA, also known as semantic dementia, there seems to be a delay of around five years on average from symptom onset, so the first uh, point in time at which you, you notice a symptom to the point at which you receive a diagnosis. So that's five whole years of uncertainty of being passed around medical professionals, of not ha having an answer. And I think that's a really important message in, in its own right. We had some really important feedback um, on these stages uh, as well. And we, we really know that we do have to be very sensitive about the way in which this information is made available. So some people made the point very fairly that it would not have been kind, it wouldn't, it, that they would not have appreciated having all of that information available to them right at the point of diagnosis. But other people, they said actually that would have been really helpful and sort of knowing uh, the, the, the path that might be, uh, the one that they might follow, would have been helpful very early on so that they could plan for the future. So we're going to think about how we can make these uh, available and there's still a little bit more work to do around validating that we, for instance, we'd like to see whether some colleagues some collaborators in Australia 
would be happy to, to validate the stages with uh, their PPA support group members out there so that we can ensure they really are representative of PPA as a whole. So that's that's work that was that we're still doing. And another, I think, really important uh, comment that came out was that actually this this work really focused on the deficits on on problematic symptoms that that emerge over the course of PPA. And what people said very reasonably, very fairly, was that actually what would be really helpful to do would be to focus on activities and, and what people can still do rather than what they can't do. And that's something I, I agree is is really really important and something that we're hoping to do as well so i'll leave it there thanks so much for listening um, and i guess the, the overall message that i'd like to get across is that although we might be working from home uh, although we're not conducting face-to-face -face research in the same way that we'd like to at the moment thanks to your support we really have been able to compete to, to keep the research up and despite everything i think it's a really exciting time for ppa research so thank you Um, so hi everybody, just to say that we had a message halfway through that to say that uh, one or two people couldn't see that video unfortunately, so I'm really sorry about that, uh, best laid plans uh, and all that. Just to let you know, this meeting is being recorded and that would be available on YouTube afterwards if you did want to, want to watch, but uh, apologies again. Thank you so much Chris. And, uh... I mean, that's such a striking, striking example of ingenuity, uh, I think. And the, the team here, the research team, in particularly my lab, I'll, I'll plug shamelessly, are very intrepid. The PhD students are, as you can imagine, having to kind of really retool a lot of their research. And they are doing that very successfully. Some of their names were mentioned. Uh, and Chris, as a senior postdoctoral scientist in the lab, as his other life away from the PPA support group, um, is very much an ideas man behind a lot of the, the bright ideas for the work that we do, particularly around the processing of speech and particularly the processing of speech under challenging listening conditions, which has been very much his baby. Um, and we've got a lot of exciting work, including the work that he touched on very briefly about showing that people with PPA retain capacity, for example, to learn to understand speech, which is incredibly important when we think for things like rehabilitation. But actually, I think I speak for him in just saying that the staging work is probably in some ways the work that we find the most exciting. And, you know, if we could actually arrive at a workable, validated staging system for PPA so that we could tell people when they came to clinic where they are in the illness, that will be a phenomenally important step forward. And if, when and if we get there, that will be, um, you know, largely down to all of you who will have been the people who have actually informed us about what these stages are. So rather than sitting in a, a kind of a neurological ivory tower, trying to decide what we think the stages are, it will be because you told us what they were. So I think that's incredibly exciting as a model for future research. Now I'll, I'll hand over our next speaker is Anna Faulkner, now Dr. Anna Faulkner, who is um, a highly specialist speech and language therapist, um, who one of the very exciting things that happened, I think unfortunately just before COVID broke, uh, but has been really going on since and around that is is bringing Anna into our clinic uh, and being the person who very much leads on the clinical speech and language therapy service that we deliver and and then outreach to the various regional speech and language therapy services, which has been I, I think genuinely has transformed, been transformative in our service. Um, but but Anna has a, a sort of an academic program of research as well as her clinical side and. Um, always very interested um, to hear from her about kind of her, her thoughts about things, but in particular, of course, in the current climate, um, how we might still be able to deliver speech and language therapy and use video and remote technologies um, in that way. So Anna, without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jason, for that introduction. So um, given that so many of us are unable to see each other in person and that no, no one's able to access health and social care in, in person either, um, we're finding that not only are people socialising differently on the telephone and via virtual means on the internet, but also healthcare is being delivered differently, often on the telephone, but we in speech and language therapy are more and more delivering our interventions and our consultations remotely via video conferencing. So with that in mind, 
I've actually been asked a number of times to provide some tips on the best ways to use um, video conferencing to maximize communication. And I'm sure you're all aware that video conferencing actually provides a great advantage for people with primary progressive aphasia because being able to see a person's face provides key advantages. So being able to see a person's face allows you to see their facial expressions, their gestures, allows you to establish some eye contact, and um, you can see a person's lip movements. And for people with PPA, that's often really helpful in interpreting words and language alongside the context of their environment. So to give you an example, I was having a conversation via a video platform recently with somebody, a couple, one of whom had PPA. And in that conversation, the lady with PPA was able to actually show me around her house, show me photos of her family members, show me her garden. And because she had all the materials there, it made the conversation really effective. It wasn't just an audio conversation on the phone. It actually felt like I was in her own home and we were having a really functional conversation. And I'd like to stress here that um, when you're having video calls, it's actually really helpful for PPA in terms of how they might understand others because they can see the other person, but it also helps the person with PPA express themselves because as we know, when somebody has a language impairment we or a communication difficulty, we try and encourage them to use all their mod modalities. So not just talking, but everything around them, their facial expression, their tone. I, I keep mentioning these again. So today I thought it would be helpful to share some tips and hints, as mentioned. And I've got a couple of slides to accompany that which I'm gonna ask um, that we pop up. That's lovely, thank you. So the first and perhaps the most obvious thing is to make sure before you make a call that you have really good internet connection and that you're, you have your microphone actually on and that you're in a spot where you can actually use your microphone. So I've had a couple of calls with people where they've actually had the radio on at the same time or they've actually been sat in the garden and there's some wind and noise, traffic noise in the background. So making your, sure that you're sat in a really quiet environment is really valuable. And of course, making sure the video camera is on. Now, if you're gonna have the video camera on, which is what I think is really valuable for people with PPA, it's really important to make sure that you're in an appropriate space to use the video camera. So what I would always recommend is to make sure that the space you're in is quite well lit so that other people can see your face and you can see the screen, but also that you're appropriately dressed and that there are people in the that there are no other people in the environment. So as a health care professional, I have had some uh, video calls with people and they've had grandchildren in the call and we've had to ask them to kindly um, move the grandchildren out of the call and this will be the same for if you're doing a video call for a research purposes or for therapy purposes that it's really important that the only people in the call are the people who've consented to be in the call and also that there's not too many people around you so you can actually concentrate on the camera and now I'm talking about the camera what's really valuable is to make sure that you know where the camera is on your computer because there's some occasions where people haven't known where the camera is so they've not been able to actually look into the camera and equally that's really important for the people receiving the call and if you move on to the next slide um, we will see some examples of what we sometimes uh, see in in virtual calls so if you're in a, in a great space with good lighting, that's a really good start, but you need to make sure that the person at the other end can actually see you, that they can't just see the top of your head or just the bottom of your face or just the side of your face. What's really important is that 
the person themselves is in the center of the screen and that you're actually making eye contact or looking at the camera where possible. And if there's more than one person in the call, that they're both sat in, in the call. I've had some conversations where there's been one person talking to the camera and then these magical voices appear from, from around the back of the camera. And that can be really confusing and distracting. Now, once you've made sure that you're all set up and that everyone can be seen, I would always recommend giving feedback to the other person. So if you can't see the person at the other end, it's really valuable to tell them. Notably, group conversations are particularly difficult. That said, I'd like to share that some of the people with PPA that I've been working with have found group conversations easier remotely because everybody has to listen when you talk. So only one person can talk at a time. Now, just moving to the final slide, I wanted to stress that this is a slide that explains the video um, conferencing um, facility that many hospitals are now using. It's called Attend Anywhere. And many hospitals are using this platform because this is a, considered a more secure platform sometimes than some of the other more uh, commercially available platforms. If you're asked to use this platform, the, the, um, the health and social care service will provide you with detailed, accessible instructions on how to uh, access the platform. And in the hospital here at, at um, Queen Square, we also have somebody who will make contact with you in advance to make sure you understand how to use that in advance. So don't feel concerned if this isn't a platform you've used in the past. But if you do have a preference and there is a certain video call that you find much easier, then please do say and flag that. So I just wanted to finish by uh, with a final comment, which is that I have found, I've spoken to many, many people who've never ever used video calling before. And they, they, their feedback has been that just having a go, just diving right in and having a go has been a great experience. And that they've been really pleasantly surprised at how easy it is and how much easier it is to talk to somebody with a video. And they've said that it's made them feel really connected to people during this, this period of time. So thank you very much for listening and I will hand back over to Jason. Um, well, thanks very much for that. Uh, Anna, um, uh, Jason has, uh, I knew Jason had to move to a different room of his house, um, so I wondered if he caught you uh, mid-move. Um, but yes, thank you, so, thank you so much. That was that was really helpful. And I learned a lot from your updates uh, as well, so thank you. Um, we're actually moving on to the next part of the, of the agenda now. So can I ask for all of the panelists to come back into shot? That's lovely. Great, thank you. And so what we'll do is we've been sent through a number of questions in advance, which is really great. Um, and if you would like to, uh, those of you watching, if you'd like to ask us some questions as we go through, if you can put those into the questions box rather than the chat box, that would be really helpful. Um, but we'll we'll kick things off with this, the first question that we got via email earlier in the week, which was, do you think that tau protein trials will take place next year? So I might direct that to Jason, first of all. Um, so thank you, Chris. Um, so so this is actually, uh, I suppose the whole area, the whole question of therapy in PPA is both an exciting area and also a bit of a frustrating one. Um, it's exciting because there have been, there have been trials in in um, diseases that are relevant to PPA, if I put it that way, and in particular, um, the disease that's often focused on that's sort of allied most closely, I guess, is this disease PSP. Uh, or progressive supranuclear palsy. I mean, the, the neurologists have these endless strings of acronyms and letters, which are just really confusing for everybody, ultimately including the neurologists. Um, so, you know, I forgive anybody who, who had trouble keeping up. But PSP is a disease which is caused very purely, usually, by uh, protein tau. And protein tau, as I think many of you will probably know, 
being very informed about the illnesses uh, is one of the key proteins that causes um, PPA. But there are different forms of it and different forms of it cause different types of disease. And one of the reasons why this disease PSP is being focused on is because it, it's one of the diseases where neurologists can predict quite safely usually uh, from what a person looks like clinically, uh, what they're likely to have in their brain in terms of proteins, which is not possible, unfortunately, for all the diseases in front of temporal dementia and other dementias. And so that's been a bit of a target. And the reason it intersects with um, PPA, as some of you will know, is that there's a very important kind of subgroup of patients with PSP that present with um, language, speech and language problems, particularly non-fluent speech. But also because a lot of people, uh, again, unfortunately, I think many of you will know, uh, who have P PPA, particularly the non-fluent sort, uh, will get Parkinson's-like, complex Parkinson's-like features. And that that's the disease group that PSP represents. So there's this important overlap. So that's been a target, and there have actually been uh, trials of protein-directed um, therapy, uh, in particular antibody-directed therapy, and also therapies directed at changing one of the enzymes or the, the, the kind of key proteins in cells that does the step where the abnormality of the protein, so the adding of phosphorylated uh, um, uh, protein to the to the to the normal protein, which is the jargon for the sort of the abnormality that goes on with tau protein, uh, to block that step, that, that's that's been used. But they've been relatively small trials, and so far they haven't been very um, effective. So it, what we don't really what we don't really have um, is at the moment is a very kind of I suppose PPA specific sort of uh, treatment, uh, disease modifying treatment, um, and that of course is one of the big research areas. But I think it's likely that people with PPA will get recruited into trials of other diseases that are relevant to them. And PSP will be one example of that, but there are likely to be others. Um, and so there are trials that are in sort of planning stage. So I think the answer, probably the short answer is, is yes, there are likely to be trials. Hopefully COVID won't have derailed the process too much uh, next year um, in diseases relevant to PPA. But it's very difficult to give you sort of precise um, chapter and verse about exactly what form they will take or where they might be, you know, what the entry points will be to those. I think um, one of the, the well, the two people that are very relevant to this, John Rohrer, who, of course, some of you, many of you will know, who runs a, a big genetic um, FTD study, uh, GenFi, which is multinational, uh, is, is very, one of the big missions of that work is to set up trials and some of those trials be relevant to PPA and they're ongoing. And the other one, person to mention probably is um, uh, Professor Hugh Morris uh, here at the Institute of Neurology who has a special interest in PSP who's very uh, interested in running trials and planning new trials and so I think people like that would be good people to keep an eye on and maybe contact if there's interest about um, being involved in trials that might be suitable for you from the point of view of therapy but I understand why that's obviously a very big consideration for everybody so sorry for spending a bit of time on that. No, I think that's, that's a really helpful answer. Thank you, Jason. Um, and it connects to another question that we were asked, actually. So this is a question around people who have balance issues, uh, as well as problems with speech and language. Um, and Claire, I wondered if you could say something uh, about what support might be available for people who, who have problems with balance. Yeah, of course. So I would say that if people are developing issues with balance, that it is really helpful to go back to the GP for additional referrals onwards for specialist support with this. So this might include occupational therapy to help with aids around the home and navigating the home and physiotherapy as well, which might also help with walking aids because one of the things with balance issues is that people might be at a higher risk of having falls. So it's important to have that support in place to help reduce the likelihood of that happening. Um, it also might be helpful if this is a new symptom to have a carers and a needs assessment as well to figure out what other support might be available. So that's through the local authority, through social services. And also just to have a look at the general home environment as well. So minimizing clutter, securing loose rugs, all that kind of thing, just to help prevent falls in the home if somebody is starting to get a little bit wobbly. Great, thank you so much. Um, so unless anyone else has anything to add 
in response to that. Uh, we'll move on to the next question, which is, uh, what is the rate of deterioration for those of us with semantic dementia and what are the symptoms? So if it's okay, Anna, I'll come to you first, if you could say a little bit about symptoms and then I might come to you a bit later, Jason, to talk about the progression, if that's okay. Yes, of course. So um, when I meet people with semantic variant PPA or semantic dementia, they often say that one of the first symptoms is, is problems with thinking of words or word finding, often names in particular, they find difficult and um, they might not only find it difficult to think of words, but also understand some words. So for example, I was talking to a gentleman and I asked him how many siblings he had. And he said, ask me, what is a sibling? So he was find it really difficult to understand what words are. Then as people, um, change they will often find that their speech becomes more and more empty so they'll often use um general words to describe specific things so instead of names specific names they might say he she they or it so instead of saying a, calling a dog by its um uh, breed they might just call it an animal using very generalized phrases particularly for proper names proper nouns and they may also find that they have more and more difficulties understanding words and become more fixed in on being able to talk about certain topics. So people often say to me that my partner has kind of favorite topics. We only talk about certain topics. And if I try and move on to other topics, we don't really talk about them and we always go back to the same old topic. What we do find is actually that numbers often are, are something that people can really use in conversation and numbers are some, I was just talking to somebody this morning who was saying, the partner was saying, I often give my husband advice, uh, instructions. And if I say, could you grab three apples? He can grab three, but he's not sure what the actual object is he should be grabbing. Then as people progress even more, um, we sometimes find they use real stereotype phrases or, or scripts. So people will often be able to still be able to access some of the social niceties, for example. So uh, somebody said to me, it's really easy for me to chat with my neighbors and say, how are you? I'm all right. Nice weather, that kind of thing, because that's very easy to access. But anything more in depth, they find really difficult. And actually along outside that journey as people's symptoms develop, they also might have more and more difficulties recognizing objects. So I talked about recognizing and the names of specific animal breeds, but actually people will often find even more day-to-day -day objects harder and harder to recognize. And I think we've had examples from Chris in the past where a person with semantic variant PPA has tried to lay the table and instead of using cups, use toilet rolls because they were visually similar. So that gives you a bit of an idea of the things you might see. Great, thanks, Anna. And Jason, do you have anything to add to that? That's very comprehensive. Sorry, Jason, did you have anything to add to that? Sorry, I was, I was, I was, I was uh, temporarily uh, under lost of the power of speech through a central um, route, but I've now regained that. Um, yeah, yes, I mean, I think it's um, very important and, and we, we still do lack quite a lot of important information, hence the need for the staging and so on that we spoke about. But um, somatic dementia, you know, is, is a very puzzling illness in many ways. Um, and I don't completely endorse what, what Anna just said about there's a sequence that we sort of recognise neurologically and, and actually the other dimension to it, apart from this sort of erosion of knowledge about increasingly more basic things it starts off with much more specialized rarefied knowledge becomes much more about um, more basic things and of course somatic dementia even though we do think of it as one of the PPAs that's mainly because by virtue that language is a very very taxing uh, function for the brain's knowledge systems you know knowledge of vocabulary for example is one of the most precise knowledge bases that most of us carry around uh, in our everyday lives uh, and but, but of course somatic dementia is a disease of the knowledge systems of the brain and that can certainly lead to knowledge of visual things, sounds, what sounds mean, um, which can be very frightening for people and also perplexing for those around them. But also it's knowledge of uh, other people's signals and social behavior as well. And the concepts that we take for granted about around things like emotions and social behavior. And when these go down, unfortunately, people with somatic dementia can get very prominent changes in behavior, 
which are similar to the ones that some of you, because I know many of you are very well informed, will we'll have read or heard about being with the behavioural variant, frontotemporal dementia. It begins to look quite similar in many ways. People that just uh, are having difficulty conducting themselves socially, etc., having insight into their disease, etc., as it goes along. And the tempo, I would say, just purely from bedside observation, and actually, um, this is one of the things we have to try and substantiate. I would say somatic dementia starts off often with a, you know, a fairly subtle lead-in, where people are often struggling with, you know, with words and word meanings, but but particularly finding words, the words they need. They tend to go around the the point. And it can stay like that for a while, and then there's a phase of relatively quick change where people are accumulating problems. And then it seems again down the track to plateau, for, sometimes for many years. Um, you know, we've had people, you know, certainly in our clinical service and support group with somatic dementia that we who are living with the illness for well over a decade or more. So, you know, it's, it can be a kind of <clears throat> a lot of the damage seems to be done in the brain. Uh, and then, uh, then there's this sort of, well, I wouldn't say compensated, but there's this plateau sort of phase. And so, at a very practical level, it's obviously trying to make sure people are supported at each stage of that process because the you can imagine the needs are very different because initially it's all around how can I maximise my functioning in life and society in my job, maybe depending on what your job involves, and then but then it's really about how do we what are the best strategies we can use for managing in a world that's been um, sort of stripped of a lot of its meaning, um, which, which of course is something that you know. People need a huge amount of support for, and and people around them need a lot of understanding for how that could possibly be. You know, it's not something that most sort of doctors or neurologists are kind of used to thinking about. You know, it's a very different model of how a brain disease works. Um, so I think education, making sure people are actually understanding what is happening, it shouldn't be underestimated. And add some of the things that Anna's mentioned about, you know, very practical things um, are, are what at the moment what we tend to focus on for that whole long, often very long duration of SD. Great, thank you, Jason. Um, did anyone else have anything to add to that? I think it's quite comprehensive. Great. So we'll move on. Um, so the next question, um, I'll read this out directly. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice on how to encourage regular teeth brushing. Uh, my mum has PPA and only seems to uh, do it sporadically. And also any recommended approaches to ensure a successful visit to the dentist. Mum is uh, unable to say much, so this might be a challenge. So Claire, I might come to you first and then maybe Seb afterwards, if that's, if that's okay for them to ask. Yeah, no problem. Um, so it might depend on whether you live with your mum or not, what practical strategies you can put in place. Um, but it may be that she's not remembering to do it. So it may be just a little bit of prompting might be needed in order to help with that. It may be that the physical action of it is difficult as well. So it may be a case of if you do live with her or if there is a carer in place in the home, of brushing your teeth at the same time to help prompt that or to even assist her with putting toothpaste on the brush and that kind of thing as well. Um, if it is something that she's not really enjoying and that's why she's not doing it, it might be a case of making the environment a little bit more relaxing to kind of prompt that. So maybe putting some music on or brushing your teeth in a different place in the house if that is a preferred place for her. Um, in terms of the dentist, so this can be a distressing environment. I think most people agree for everybody. Most people don't really enjoy going to the dentist. Um, so it may be a case of trying to do this in the easiest way possible. So for example, um, first initially making sure the dentist is aware that your mother does have a form of dementia and inquiring whether they have any training around people living with dementia. So one way of trying to access that is through your local Dementia Action Alliance because they often have a list of places in the community that, that do have dementia training and dementia awareness as well. It might also be a case of trying to arrange the appointment with the dentist at a time of day that is best for your mum. So it might be that mornings might be a little bit easier and she might find things a little bit more distressing in the afternoon. So kind of working around that and also trying to visit the dentist at a quiet time of day in general for the dentist as well. 
Um, but yeah, so there's just a, a couple of things that you can try, but always do come back to us specifically and we can have a further chat one on one about any other concerns about that. Great, thank you. I was going to say, uh, I think that's absolutely right. And uh, it also flags up for me the value of these sorts of potential value of these sorts of support groups. I suspect it's difficult when we're in this situation where you can't talk directly uh, with each other. But I suspect there will be other people on this meeting who've been in a similar situation. And one of the things we're very keen to do at the moment is to create short resources, little films. In this case, for example, a dentist who has worked with someone with a dementia, perhaps even a rare dementia like PPA before, sharing their experience in a couple of minutes with potential colleagues who might not have been in that situation before, of just what are the things that you can do, the little tweaks, the little adjustments to the way you practice, the way you try and describe or demonstrate what it is that you're about to do to, in order to manage someone's agitation that would be really Really helpful and so there might be someone out there if you have had a good experience with a dentist please we'd love to know because it's exactly those kind of people we'd like to go to to say would you mind us asking you a few questions so that for the rest of you who've not been in this situation yet the next time you go to your appointment even if it's in you can't find as I was suggesting even if you can't find a, a surgery that has particularly had dementia experience, you might have something right there and then on your phone or a simple sheet you can give them that might just prompt them or guide them or just give them a little bit of a cue to think, how can I do this a little bit better or a little bit more suitably for the person who's in front of me? So please, if you have those experiences, obviously we're not just interested in, in dentistry too, other, other professionals, people, at, you know, for the visual group, we're talking a lot about um, good experience with optometrists. Um, with citizens vice bureau workers, with, with solicitors you might see, all of those inter in, uh, good interactions that you've had where you feel, feel that people have made a particular effort or have had particular skills to, uh, to tailor what they can offer to you, to your situation and to your condition. We'd love to hear those good, good case stories, please. Great, thank you, Seb. Anna, did you have something to add? Yes, I just wanted to add that in some areas uh, there are community dentists who come to your home, but that's very variable. And I also wanted to add really um, companies what Seb mentioned about having some maybe something on your phone or a handout in advance with some accessible visual materials. So for it, it can be even before you go to the dentist, I've worked with people and um, setting up a visual routine. Um, having in the bathroom maybe a laminated sheet on the wall reminding people what they do in what order. So reminding them that, that one, you go to the toilet, two, you brush your teeth, three, so that people know the routine and reminded by that with visual images of that. And then equally preparing them to go to the dentist with kind of visual images of what to expect, maybe taking a photo of the actual dentist you're going to, taking a photo of the, of the room in advance, maybe preparing people, many other healthcare professionals have never met anybody with a communication difficulty and don't know what to do. So sometimes sharing with them and, and telling them in advance what tips and hints uh, can support communication and even preparing a kind of worksheet handout with some of those pictures on can be really helpful. Great, thank you. That's, that's really helpful. Um, so we'll move on to another question now. So this one, um, could you explain a bit about why people with PPA have difficulties sometimes with pneumonia and with choking and if this will make them more at risk from getting very sick if they contract COVID-19? So Anna, as our speech language therapist, I might come to you first to talk about the choking and then Jason, if you'd like to weigh in after that uh, to talk about the risk of, of COVID, that would be really helpful. I get, asked, I get asked this question quite a lot. And people become very, very worried about eating and drinking, about choking. But I, what I'd like, I always start by reassuring people and explaining that, that this risk is, is relatively minimal, but um, there's some really useful strategies we can suggest to minimize this. So speech and language therapists, the other thing I should also mention that many people do not know is that speech and language therapists are also experts in assessing people's swallow function. And what we do is we observe the muscles of the lip and tongue and mouth and throat. We look at the types of foods people are eating. We look at how people are eating. And what we, one of the most common things we see with these rare dementias is actually that 
some of the difficulties with eating and drinking are less to do with the musculature, but actually to do with things like recognizing food, recognizing how big a mouthful to take, how fast to eat, how, um, how much to eat in one go and when to swallow. So some of the strategies we suggest are around managing that kind of the, the, the environment, how to prompt people to slow down. And to, so we and what we often suggest as well is actually having modifying the foods themselves. So we know there's certain foods people are more likely to choke on. Anybody is more likely to choke on. So things like really tough meats are always harder. Um, so uh, vegetables, so things like cherry tomatoes with a peel on or, or grapes are particularly difficult, sausages with the peel on, so that we would go through people's meals and, and give them tips and hints. Um, and there are some people with PPA, particularly people maybe more with non-fluent variant PPA, and this perhaps links in with some of the discussion we've had already about people who may have PSP symptoms or more, so more motor symptoms, so balance issues and more, more issues affecting their muscle function, that people in that group may also develop some difficulties with the control of food in their mouth and throat. And that's where it's really valuable to have a swallow assessment. And we can again make some suggestions around the texture of the, the food and drink, and also around ways of actually move, sitting, how to swallow strategies really. But um, I always also like to emphasize here that when if we're discussing pneumonia, food, so swallowing difficulties, so food and drink occasionally going down the wrong way happens to everybody. But if this happens and people cough, you're protecting your airway. And But if things go down into your airway, it, it's increasing the risk of having a chest infection like an, or a pneumonia, but it doesn't cause a pneumonia, okay? And I really like to stress that because people become very worried about that. And if you would like to chat to me individually, because this is a very individual issue, I would really advocate you calling up the, the um, support group helpline and I can talk to you individually and go through your individual concerns. And we are doing video assessments remotely to talk about what's going on with individuals. Great, thank you, Anna. And Jason, could you say something about risk of COVID-19 in people with PPA? Yeah, thank, thanks and thanks Anna. Um, yeah, I mean it, it, we, the first thing to say is we're still getting information and, and, and because these are rare diseases and, and you know they, you can imagine with all the interest in such a range of different conditions and how they interact with COVID, we, we just need to, it's a very important piece of work to be done to get information about the particular variants and what their risk may or may not be. But having said that, we can think about some things from first principles. So, I mean, one of the things that makes people vulnerable to, to COVID, to, to infection with COVID is um, immune changes in immune status. Well, you know, we, so we can sort of work through sort of some of the factors and how they might be relevant to PPA or not relevant. So as far as we know, you know, there are not um, major, major changes in immune competence in PPA. I mean, certainly there, there's a lot of interesting research and, it, and people have, Made some interesting observations suggest that there might be some links to autoimmune conditions and you know there may be some factors there so i don't want to oversimplify this but it certainly isn't the same level of risk of somebody that's had you can imagine cancer treatment or uh, has a major immunosuppressive illness where you know a virus would be a very very serious thing indeed because their body wouldn't be able to fight it off sort of thing that's not usually a factor with ppa but there are other factors so for example one of them is behavioral uh, and we know that as for example people's ability to regulate their own behavior you know we're all having to do this and I think everybody has struggled to some extent you know we're living in a world where you know hand washing obsessional hand washing not touching your own face not you know being very aware of what you touch and keeping your distance from other people all those things are obviously much more difficult for people with any form of cognitive impairment including PPA at the level of understanding, at the level of monitoring their own behaviour, at the level of being aware of what other people are actually doing and avoiding them, all that stuff. So that must have some bearing in terms of wanting to protect people with PPA and be really, really vigilant. And the other thing to say, which may be more behind the question, I don't know, but if someone with PPA actually gets, unfortunately gets COVID and we still don't, you know, we don't know in detail what the kind of numbers of, for that will, will be, 
But if they do, with respect to some of the things that Anna said, you can also think of it as being what kind of reserve they have in terms of being able to cope with that. Because we know that most people, you know, it's a nasty lung, well, it can be a nasty lung disease. It tends to be a lung disease, which can be nasty. Um, that if your lung reserve is down or your ability to control your airway and, you know, your kind of um, response to having a virus, your breathing control is affected, you may well be vulnerable. And that particularly, I mean, I guess, and again, just to stress, this is not because we've seen the people with this and have studied it properly, but just from first principles, you might be a bit concerned that someone with a non-fluent form, for example, might have less reserve in that situation. Um, but, you know, very difficult to estimate exactly how, what level of concern that would be, um, but just in principle. Um, and um, of course, you know, the other the other sort of way of, of looking at that is that, um, you know, we, we don't we don't really um, know whether sort of there's some kind of, I suppose you'd say an interaction between sort of having the having the virus and some other factor with just being generally vulnerable, you know, from having a neurological brain disease that might influence your ability to kind of cope with it once it's there. The other organ that's emerged is somewhat in the background to the lungs, but it is important, particularly for our patients, and not just people with PPA, but neurological patients, is the brain. And the brain is a target organ, it seems, for COVID. So you get people with this uh, condition that's called encephalopathy or encephalitis, which seems to be COVID related. And of course, you would think that just as if you've got reduced lung or heart reserve, you might be vulnerable. You know, if your brain is affected by a disease for some reason, you may imagine that that might reduce the ability of the brain to kind of cope with having an infection coming in like that. And the way that might manifest might be different. And I actually have heard anecdotally of one or two people, I think, with PPA who, who've had this kind of what seems to have been a very severe kind of confusional uh, state or an encephalopathy as neurological jargon would have it. So there's that aspect. But I think, you know, we can't give you, no, I don't think anyone can give you exact levels of um, risk at this stage and that, that would take some time to come out. I think what we can say, we should be saying is to be, regard people as being, you know, with PPA as not, perhaps not being highly vulnerable, being relatively vulnerable and, and trying to protect them. And, and in particular, the behavioural strategies that I mentioned, being very vigilant about that becomes very important uh, for as long as COVID is a significant thing with us, which seems to be, it seems like it, it will be around and the adjustments to COVID will be around with us for some months to come, at least, I think. Great, thank you very much, Jason. Seb, did you want to say anything uh, as well? I know you've sort of led the RDS response to uh, there's been lots of questions about, about this relationship with rare dementias and COVID. Did, and did, did you want to say anything about the materials that we've produced? Sorry, there's always one who forgets to unmute. Um, only to flag up uh, the work that Ida Suarez Gonzalez, a number of you will have met and know before, has done to publicise the issues, and she's working with an international group. So some of the um, to the questions that Jason uh, uh, raised and those unknowns will, will emerge over time and it's encouraging to me at least that uh, professionals are working across different countries to share learning across the, um, across the European Union and across the world um, to understand the great the wider impact um, that, uh, that COVID is having on people with different forms of dementia and in, and in different settings as well obviously a big difference across people living at home and people living in care homes. Um, and certainly I did, did, a, did a lot along with the rest of the team um, to provide some practical tips earlier on, which I hope people found useful. Um, yeah. That's great, thank you. Did anyone else want to say anything in response to that one? Great. Well, it's become quickly apparent that we have more questions than we do time. Um, so just to assure you, if we don't get through your question now, we will, uh, all of the experts we've, we've got here, we'll take time to answer those and we put those in our FAQ section on our website as well. So if we don't get to your question today, I'm really sorry, um, but don't fear, we will answer that and, and we'll send you a link to, to the website where we'll have those in detail. So perhaps just time for uh, one more. We had a few questions uh, about this actually. Um, so the issue is around the experience of pain in PPA. And two people wrote in separately to say that their relative experience 
generalized pain in legs, head, arms, but with no apparent cause. Um, and so, Jason, I wondered if you, if you could say a, a little bit about what we know about the perception of pain in PPA. Yeah, no, no, thank you, Chris. No, no, there's a very important issue, very under um, misunderstood, under researched, but I think that is really changing. I'll try, try and explain why. So, um, it, I think the most basic thing to say is that the experience of pain is likely to be altered in many people with PPA um, at a very general level level um, and particularly as the disease goes along so you know it's not typically a dominant feature when people first come along but it, but during the course of the illness it's very common and and actually you know pain it's very interesting we tend to think about pain as what happens if you stub your toe or step on a plug but actually pain is much broader than that of course the pain is kind of got a very prominent emotional dimension um, and and anything that involves your ability to be resilient to psychological and emotional stress, even in otherwise healthy people, affects their perception of pain. It really does measurably. Uh, you know, and this is one of the reasons why things like music and so on have been used as strategies to try and improve people's just general well-being, and it can have remarkably powerful analgesic effects in some cases. So, emotional processing it alters it, but the perception and processing of bodily signals of all kinds, and and actually we know that this happens in that this gets altered in in PPA. Uh, the parts of the brain, like for example, the insula, which means, means island, which is the little island of cortex that lies beneath the temporal lobe, is a very important hub for for processing signals about ourselves and our bodily state, and also our environment and how those two things intersect. And this is very, very important, as you can imagine, to pain. Um, and that that is affected in um, certainly well, actually, really in probably all forms of PPA, but at different at different stages. So we've actually studied this at a neuroscience level, and we've shown where these changes are. We've shown that people with um, different forms of PPA have these changes. It's very, it, it's very unusual that you can have changes in different directions, and they're both equally important to be aware of. So there can be people with um, PPA who become very sensitive to the slightest thing, even disliking touch and even innocuous things, um, and that can of course be a problem for nursing and caring for them more generally. Um, and, and, you know, it can be a source of distress if it's not recognised. We also get people who become insensitive to pain to a striking degree sometimes, to the point where they, it'd be easy to miss that they had a dental problem or, a, you know, something going seriously wrong with them because they won't necessarily tell you. And it doesn't seem to be just that they can't communicate it, although that's a really important dimension to PPA, that, you know, it's one thing to experience something, how do you tell somebody else or get that across? But it seems to be even more basic than that, that there's a change in the way that person actually reacts to pain. And we can, we can, you can get some ways to try and bypass speech and language, which is of course very important. To, how do you know if this person has, a, has experienced pain or distress? So you can look for things like, um, we call autonomic responses, so automatic arousal responses that the body would mount if it's stressed or anxious or fired up in some way. So you can look at people's heart rates, you can look at their pupils dilating, you can look at their skin changes, sweatiness, um, and the, they, these can be measured clinically, but we've, we've looked at this in the lab and shown that those changes are altered in people with PPA. So it's a very fundamental change. It isn't just, oh, they can't tell you. Um, but I think, you know, knowing that is one thing, but how do we kind of cope with it? It's very important to have some practical management. One of the things is to actually be asking about it and looking for sources of potential distress pain and anticipating them you know we're getting quite a lot of talk about dentistry today <laughs> that's because we all miss our dentists but the debt the dental checkup and you know getting and taking people to the gp and you know getting it sorted out is sort of early not relying on the fact that they will necessarily tell you the same way that someone who didn't have people will tell you um giving the communication aids and would be the expert but things that they can they can actually indicate to you first of all whether or not they have the pain going on um probably understanding the insight and and kind of ability to be aware of what's going on can change. I mean, I'd say based on our research, particularly um, semantic dementia, for the reasons that we've talked about with the awareness and understanding of signals, seems to be the most striking of the PPA uh, syndromes in terms of changes in pain. And people can get very sensitive or insensitive to pain in a very unpredictable way. And probably even over the course of the illness, 
it can check it can flip from one to the other so it's very hard to, to manage and care for that you really have to be very vigilant um, but I, I certainly am not suggesting it's only people with somatic dementia that, that would have these changes and we're still getting a lot more information about about this there is a lot of research it's a it really is a big growth area and I'm involved I'm not I'm not the lead but my colleague uh, Professor Liz Sampson in the Division of Psychiatry and I think Liz has spoken to this group before actually maybe um, is very interested in pain and end of life issues actually as well so that that kind of palliative type approaches symptom control best symptom management and how we can optimize that for people with PPA um, has been a major research interest of her she's got a very large program grant now to look at this the, and Liz and Seb who runs of course is running our RDS and has a, um, a big program of work around that We'll be collaborating about this as well so so you know we, there's a lot of interest in getting better at measuring it and ultimately of course hopefully getting better at treating it um, and managing it um, but at the moment this is it's much more about awareness and simple things and get anticipating problems than it is about analgesia and giving people drugs at the moment we, you know we, we're much more keen to prevent um, these diseases and, and the difficulties arising where we can uh, in people with PPA. That's great, thank you, Jason. Does anyone else have any thoughts about that? Seb? I just wanted to briefly mention it's a real um, area for us to encourage you, if it's okay, to tell us about the more unusual, the parts of your experience which you're not sure if it's part of PPA or not, won't always know what's going on. Um, and it may sometimes be that uh, the extra symptoms or experiences you're having are due to something completely unrelated. But it's through sharing experiences um, that you can both inform us as scientists to try and understand, to widen and deepen our understanding of these rare conditions. And also in it, it support people like Claire to support others by us having a clearer picture about what are the common expressions of these additional elements, which aren't the, like the frontline symptoms like language problems, but may be something which is experienced by lots of people at some point. One quick example from the uh, PCA support group, the group for people with the visual forms of dementia, is that had traditionally always been referred to as the visual dementia. Um, but in relation to one of the earlier questions at one of our meetings a few years ago, someone expressed very clearly a striking symptom of a, of a balance problem, which immediately prompted a number of other people around the room to say, oh, you get that, oh, I get that too. And it's only through those connections being made by people being kind of brave and generous enough to share those experiences that we've been able to tap into understanding that aspect of the condition better and to anticipate it for other people so they're less shocked, less likely to be thinking, oh, crikey, there's something else going wrong with me as well as my PPA or whatever the condition is. So please do share if, if you feel able to. Jason? Yeah, I'd absolutely endorse it. And actually the staging study that Chris mentioned, one of the most striking things, so much has come out of that, including these very important things about delayed diagnosis and all those things that are very, very important to know about and to get better at. But one of the things is to the broad, very broad range of experiences that people with PPA have been the language, speech and language is really coming out to be the, of the iceberg. And we often think about a lot about the, the hearing changes, the, how the the hearing brain that is not the ears change in PPA but even beyond that there's a lot of other stuff and uh, unless we hear about it some of the time you know, sometimes it comes out in clinic visits and things but we won't know about it so it's really important I think Seb makes the, the point there on the one hand you don't want to assume that everything that goes wrong with someone is PPA because that's you know people with PPA are entitled to get other things go wrong with them it's very important that that is looked into and not just assume that any symptom they have is PPA but on the other hand, that you're walking a line because there's no doubt that there are strange symptoms that seem very odd that doctors won't necessarily warn you about, which actually are part of the spectrum of PPA. And so what we have to try and do is, you know, get better at defining that boundary. But yeah, I definitely would endorse that. So. Great. Well, thank you so much. So we, we've run slightly over, so apologies for that. And uh, sorry again for not getting to all of the questions, just to reiterate. We will answer those and they will go on the website. We're trying to build up a repository of FAQs. We've been trying to do this for the last few years, actually. Um, so hopefully that should be sort of a, a first port of call for questions like these to be answered as, as we go forward. 
So I'd just like to thank all of the panellists here today, you can see on screen. I also want to say a special thank you to the three people you can't see who are behind the scenes. So this is Livy Wood, Roberta McKee Jackson and Emily Brotherhood, all of whom are doing technical wizardry of the kind that I cannot fathom uh, to make this meeting happen. Um, but it's, it's really, really appreciated. And thank you so much everyone who's, who's watching at home as, as well. So what will happen now is in a moment we'll awkwardly sort of wave goodbye and turn our webcams off. But there is a fundraising video from the National Brain Appeal to sort of see us out. So thank you very much and goodbye. Hello, my name is Eva Tate and I'm the Major Appeals Manager and Manager of the Rare Dementia Support Fund held by the charity The National Brain Appeal. The National Brain Appeal raises money as the dedicated charity for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and UCL Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. The National Brain Appeal raises funds for Rare Dementia Support's 2,000 members to help individuals living with rare and early onset forms of dementia, their families, friends and healthcare professionals. And we also hold several other funds for FTD and dementia research. The funding helps not only the support group meetings in London, but also the regional support groups, admin and support staff and all other associated expenses, including the new online support groups. When, when things return to normal, there are travel and accommodation bursaries available to help members attend the meetings. This year, we've raised our fundraising target to 300,000, and this will rise further to 350,000 by 2022 to develop and extend the service in the areas of education, support and research, with the ultimate aim that everyone affected by a form of rare dementia will have access to specialist information and support, as well as contact with other people with a similar condition. We apply for grants from grant making trusts, foundations and livery companies and have a wonderful group of supporters, some of whom are here today, who fundraise for us in an amazing variety of ways. We would love it if you would like to sign up to our RDS fundraising newsletter to hear more of these stories and receive news of how we can support this community. We have had people do head shaves for us. We have had um, a gentleman drive across the Mongolian steppe in a VW polo and we have lots of people who take part in runs and virtual runs as well. At the end of February, we held a gala dinner called Mission Possible, where we raised 110,000 for the expansion of Red Dementia support. And we are delighted to announce that in line with this expansion, the charity is committed to raise up to 7 million to create the world's first centre of excellence for Red Dementias. If anyone would like to discuss any fundraising ideas or the new capital appeal, um, please do feel free to email me or my colleague Alexis, our senior fundraising manager, who will speak about the innovative new ways you can be involved in fundraising for RDS, even during this challenging time. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alexis Gebby and I'm the senior fundraising officer at the National Brain Appeal. Um, I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you to all of you who already fundraise for RDS. We really appreciate all of your incredible efforts, especially at this difficult time. My role at the National Brain Appeal is to look after all the amazing people taking on various fundraising activities for us. We have had people challenging themselves to run marathons, cycle long distances, climb mountains and even take on skydives, all whilst raising money for RDS. We also have wonderful fundraisers out in the community who organise golf days, hold coffee mornings, host choir and carol concerts and even shave their heads. These people ensure that more people like you can be supported through Rare Dementia support. If you are interested in becoming one of our fundraising heroes, then please do contact me. I am here to support you with your fundraising and I'm more than happy to chat about any ideas that you may have. While at the moment it isn't possible to take part in a sporting challenge or hold a big fundraising gathering in your local community, we do have some fundraising ideas, such as taking on a solo virtual run or walk, hosting a quiz for your friends or family online, asking for birthday donations in lieu of going out, or even donating money that you may be saving by not travelling to work or buying your daily coffee. Do get in touch with me if you would like to get involved. In the meantime, take care and we hope to see you soon.